Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Happiness in Higher Education podcast. My name is John Hill, and I use he, him pronouns. And today I have Ava Esikoff. Yes, Ava F. Esikoff um, on, the, <laughs> on the podcast uh, for episode 18. So before we get started, I will read our mission statement. So in a world that can be engulfed in darkness, we must shine bright and lead the change or lead the charge for a better future. As we continue to shape and challenge emerging adults' mind, it is also our duty to reflect and remember what makes us happy and why we continue to do the work that we do. So like usual, now I'm going to formally introduce Ava. So Ava, she, her, is originally from Ventura, California and got her BA in psychology and a, was it a minor in health and wellness? Mm -hmm. Uh, minor in health and wellness in 2012 from California State University, Monterey Bay, CSUMB. Ava moved to Denver uh, to obtain her MA or Master's of Arts, Master's of Arts and (laughs) Higher Education Administration in 2019 from the University of Denver and now currently works full-time at DU in the Department of Health Promotion as the coordinator for alcohol and other drug prevention and education. Ava is currently or is passionate about well-being, social justice, mentorship, leadership, and supporting others, hence why she works in student affairs. That's very, very true. When she's not working, she enjoys hiking, exercising, line dancing, exploring Denver's restaurant scene on the hunt for the best vegetarian food, and spending quality time with her fiance, Brent, who was featured on episode 12 of this podcast. Yes, yes, he was. So (laughs) is there anything else that you would like to say, Ava? Oh, thank you for introducing me. You did a lovely job. And yes, you pronounced my name right. You got that. <laughs> After, you know, um, it's been what, four, five, six, five, six years of saying it incorrectly. I think it's time that someone figures out how to say, I know, I say was, the name. <laughs> I was going to, well, now I am. I say, I'm saying it past tense. Like it's not going to happen. I mean, it's going to happen. I was going to give you crap and your episode with a friend, how you told your story of mispronouncing my name. And I was like, Oh, I didn't know that. That's okay. I'm I'm happy to correct. I feel like all the other folks out there in the world with less uh, traditionally spelled and pronounced names will understand. So like, you're good. <laughs> okay. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> We're good. Um, but yeah, no, I think, I think that summarizes it pretty well. I don't think I have anything else to add at the moment. So yeah, thanks again for okay. having me on here. Yeah, no problem. All right, cool. So then if it's cool with you, then we're just going to roll into questions. Yeah. All right, cool. So the first question that I have for you is what was the reason you started to pursue a career in higher education? Oh, yeah. So uh, (laughs) I feel like a lot of people don't know this is a career right until they get to college, which is essentially where that started for me. Um, I know you were an RA, John, (laughs) at CSUMB as well. So that's where I started too. Um, I worked as a resident advisor for two years for first year students. And that was pretty much my introduction to like this whole career field. Um, I had some really great mentors and supervisors who, when I was kind of like floundering as I was studying psychology, I was like, I don't know what I want to do. Um, I had some really great people encourage me to look into this career field. And I was like, what is that? That's cool. Um, so I ended up taking a gap year in between undergrad and then my eventual graduate program to do some soul searching, um, realized that I really missed being in an academic environment. Um, and that, that was a career path I really wanted to do. So I used that year to work odd jobs and apply for grad school and do grad interviews. And I eventually landed at the University of Denver in Colorado. So that worked out. Um, and I was doing my assistantship um, in our health promotion department for two years and a full-time position opened up. So I was like, I could keep doing this. <laughs> so that's how I landed in this role. This is my technically my first professional role out of grad school. Um, so I have a big heart for people who are also in a similar position. I get to supervise graduate students in my role as well as undergraduate peer educators. So I think Um, I get to still like engage in the things that really excite me around like student growth, leadership development, um, giving students a place and a space to like engage in their passions and interests, which essentially is what college did for me. So I think in a big way, I'm giving back to a lot of the students who are in this part of their life. And I wasn't in that, I was in that part of life not too long ago. Um, So I still feel (laughs) relatable. Um, But I think too, what's uh, interested me and in how I got into this role is that 
Um, I found that I really like to learn. I consider myself a lifelong learner, not in the sense of like, I'm going to go get a doctorate, but like in the sense where I think being in a higher education system promotes a lot of opportunities to learn cool things mm -hmm. and work with really cool people who also like to learn. Um, so yeah, the environment I think really sets me up well to like, yeah, want to continue in this field. So yeah, that's kind of my background of how I how I got here and now we're talking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's awesome. I do I do have a counter question to this because okay. as someone that also got a higher education degree and had mm -hmm. an assistantship in um, health education, health promotion, depending mm -hmm. upon where you're at, that's it's different. Um, yeah. But what was it like going through the coursework while having a health and wellness assistantship that sometimes is usually would be given to like a master's of public health student or mm -hmm. someone in like more of a health and wellness uh, trajectory of their career because that's what they're studying. So what was that like for you? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think in the higher education program that I went through at the University of Denver, I think you definitely had to like make your own connections. It wasn't as natural for you, perhaps as some other folks who work in housing, student engagement, more like student success learning. Um, I think I definitely had to like make more sense of it and apply it when I was in my assistantship. Um, because I definitely was getting more of a public health training just in a higher education setting. Um, and so I had to learn a lot on my own, honestly, as far as public health goes, because I wasn't getting that, um, I wasn't getting that formal education in it. Mm -hmm. So I had to do a lot of research. I've attended so many trainings, and webinars and presentations. And again, fortunately, it's an area that interests me. So I've been motivated to do that. Um, but right, in a higher education program, it's usually so broad that you kind of have to like choose your own adventure. But I think it still has helped me with working in an institution, right? Like still learning like how it all works and who, mm -hmm. how things have come to be the way they are or why they still are the way they are. Um, so yeah, kind of like a both and. Um, I don't think I'm, I don't think I hold any like remorse or like I'm not upset <laughs> that I had to do that. I think it just took a little extra. Did you have that in your experience too, John? Yeah, no, I knew you were going to ask that. <laughs> and that's actually, that's actually one of the reasons why I asked that question, because you're the first, first person that I've had on this podcast that has uh, a health education or um, a health promotion assistantship and then moving into like being oh. in. And um, so, yeah, you, uh, when, uh, when Brent had suggested, because Brent suggested um, to have you on the podcast, you were already on the docket. But one of the interesting things that I, <laughs> one of the interesting things that I want to talk about was that specifically, because I think for me, it was a little bit more, it was easier to do it because like I had a practicum and like the women's center, I had a practicum and student conduct. So it was a little easier to, to make those connections um, mm -hmm. because the programming, it was easy to use the theory and the programs and such. But when it came to like the presentations, it was harder because it was basically like the hard science of like, this is what um, like stress and time management works like. And this is what, um, the sexual health presentations or just general things like that. But I think the, the one thing that I've enjoyed and that I've been able to do a lot more is incorporating the different theories into presentations that are a little bit more not in like in my professional world, but like to do that in a sense of not focusing on the hard science of things, but focusing more on the meta of the behavior and the more why we find ourselves, even though we say it's college students, it's also people in general do the, do the things that they do. So like mm -hmm. when you think about like alcohol, it's a coping mechanism more times than not because you get socialized to be like, it's been a hard week, let's crack a few cold ones. And then all of a sudden it continues throughout life. Cause like if you ever, once you transition outside of like being in the classroom environment of taking tests and stuff like that, then it mm -hmm. becomes real life situations like bills and all those, all those fun things that we talk about. Um, but just seeing how that those behaviors and things like that. So taking that meta approach of how a lot of our coursework or how my course, I mean, in different programs, but same stuff, but like mm -hmm. how my coursework was incorporated into that, that's kind of like the connection that I made. So it was challenging at first, um, just because when I first got, I don't know if you had this experience, but when I was told to go to grad school or like grad school would be a good thing for you, mm -hmm. I had no idea what we'd be learning. <laughs> so, <No. laughs> um, so I was Thank like, you when I came back from Illinois, I was like, yeah, so like, I really like this, like health education, um, graduate assistantship. 
And then it was about like the second week into classes where I was like, oh, this is what I'm learning. <laughs> so it was just a different, a different environment. So totally. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense for your experience. Um, and right, like there's still ways to apply. It. It's just maybe not as direct, maybe a little more nuanced as far as like what we learned. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, I feel like we could, uh, you and I, John, I feel like we could nerd out about the way that uh, health behaviors show up <laughs> in so many ways. Um, and I was actually just talking to students about this today, just thinking about like, what similar what you said, like, you know, people like come to college and maybe make the assumption that they should be choosing to drink and then they do. And then they think, oh, this is just a phase, like I'm just going to drink in college. And then once I leave, I'm going to naturally have the skills to not binge drink. And that's not true. <laughs> Um, because of the culture outside of, you know, the institution that reinforces that behavior even beyond that. And so like, right, I think that's like why I love what we do is important. We're setting them up for success to like take care of their well-being, even when they're like not here anymore <laughs> in, in a more controlled yeah. environment, right? Well, because I think that sometimes, and I mean, you've probably experienced this too, but it's kind of like having the, giving the providing the opportunity for students to have that aha moment where it's like, oh, this is how it connects to other things. Because like, uh, I'm working on different programs that are like how the same thing is uh, with like interpersonal violence work. And like, when we talk about like sexual assault and dating violence and how a lot of those behaviors and those types of relationships are based in things that like, it could be like childhood trauma or it could be like the unhealthy relationships, how you see how potentially like, in your family, how your family dynamics are and how that shapes into the next relationship. So once again, I think about the coursework of like a higher education program and like how that sets you up, but then you add that little twist of how that works in like a public health setting. And it's like, so it's like, once again, I know you talked about the whole nerdy thing, but like <laughs> it is a situation where you can get so, so much into the weeds, but also see how it interconnects where it's not a theory that someone throws out like Chickering or Baxter Magolda and you're just kind of like sitting there like, mm -hmm. like cool. cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. yeah. Totally, totally. Yeah. No, I think that is rewarding in the work and feeling like, oh good, our degree set us up for something. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. And then also you talk about the whole lifelong learning thing of like, you still have to put in the work to like, to know all the hard science and to know, you know, when you're giving a presentation about alcohol that like, you can talk about the coping behaviors and things like that, but you also have to know like how it affects the body and like dependency and like all those, all those things of like knowing the technical terms and all that. So, yeah. Basically, we're doing a lot of work is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> yes, we do. No, yes, we, we do do a lot of work. We absolutely do. <laughs> so. And it's like, you know, again, health and well-being is like so tied, like you said, so like interconnected to so many things. And so like, there is a lot of work to be done and there's so few of us. And so, you know, I hope one day people see that the resources in health and well-being will definitely uh, be sustainable and like, in the long term for students. Um, but you know, until then, <laughs> we're here. We are here. <laughs> Got gotcha. you. Mm -hmm. So all right. So moving on to the next question that I have for you is what makes you happy thinking about one thing from higher ed and then one thing in your personal life? Yeah, for sure. Um, I was trying to narrow it down professionally. And I think the piece that brings me the most joy that makes me happy in working in higher ed um, is, I kind of mentioned it in the bio piece too, but like the mentorship and supervision of students, I really enjoy. I think I've had some, I've had a variety of experiences, but mostly have been good. And I have really liked being able to like support people who are like in their professional journey, right? Like similar to me. Um, like for example, I supervise a graduate assistant who was formerly me, you know, like being able to <laughs> kind of know what it's like in their position because I worked in their position, let alone at the same institution. Um, and they're going through the higher education program here at the University of Denver too. So I think it sets us up to have like a really great relationship where I can support them in like what they're learning in class. And like we have shared language understanding of like what she's talking about. And then 
Um, also being able to kind of see where the skills in her job will support her in this career and like also helping her through the goals that will help her make, you know, make her into a higher education professional. So like I, I get excited and, you know, really like that process with that and not just grad students too, but I really like supervising and mentoring students, right? Like this is like such an exciting time of life. Like they're, you know, joining university and picking a major and taking classes and cool things. And they're a lot of times still like, I don't know what I want to do, but like being able to support them in the things they're passionate about in the moments, like the clubs they join, or in my case, peer education work, um, where they care about health and well-being. It's like really cool to be able to work with students who also share that interest. And then also having that relationship where I can help them with looking at their resume, or I can help uh, be a reference for them in jobs. And then they'll tell me afterwards, like, I got the job. One time a student sent me a plant um, when she got the job with a note that said, I got it. And I was like, oh my gosh. So <laughs> it's like, I think seeing the, I guess for lack of a better word, fruits of your labor is really rewarding in this work. And so I really like that part, even if it's like, it's not topically my job, but it's part of my job. And I, that's the part that I really yeah, I really enjoy and like leaves me, I leave work with a full cup when I get those opportunities to support um, people in their like career development and like mentor them. Mm -hmm. Nice. And then what about personally? Oh yeah, thank you. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> I got really excited about that. Could you tell? <laughs> yeah, a little bit. Well, I think it's, I think it's awesome because you even touched on like before you touch on the personal thing, like you touch on how you're kind of a one-stop shop for a potentially like a student that like you're working with or like the students that you work with because you you do have the ability to look over resumes you do have the ability to coach them through interviews because you've gone through interviews so it's kind of like one of those things that like while you had mentioned it that you are a a, a coordinator for alcohol or the drug prevention you're also doing all these things that other you know other that or like the other duties as a sign, but it's because like you yeah. want to do them and like, you know, and it's just, it's awesome. Yeah, for sure. Thank you. Yeah. I feel like that's the part of my job I choose to do, which I think is why it makes me happy because mm -hmm. I have the, I have the ability to do it and I choose to do it and I'm supported in doing it. So yeah. Nice. Yeah. So I do like that part. Um, on a personal note, <laughs> I mentioned a few in my bio for you too, but Personally, what makes me happy is like eating food. I just really like food, which feels funny um, because I'm a vegetarian. So it's kind of limiting at times. Mm -hmm. But what I do really love about higher education is when you get in a non-COVID world, when you get a lot of free food at things. And so that <laughs> just really brings me joy. <laughs> I am really here. I'm really here for the free food opportunities. <laughs> I was actually, it's funny that you mentioned that because I was actually, um, uh, one of our graduate assistants, uh, Danielle, she shadowed a presentation that I was giving today for a class. And on the way back, we were talking about like in higher ed, like sometimes, I mean, just to be blunt, we don't get paid a lot. Um, and yeah. it's, I mean, it's one of those things that like, you kind of have to be evaluated every once in a while to be like, why am I doing this? Which is not, it's not a bad question to ask yourself, but I think that it kind of like grounds you a little bit. But I think what we were, the main thing that we were talking about is that, you know, sometimes even if I'm not hungry and someone is free food, I'm always just like, you know what? I, I have two hands, I can get two plates. This could be lunch. This could be lunch and dinner for whenever. So if you can, if you can make it happen, mm -hmm. make it happen. Uh-huh, oh yeah, you take it up no matter what. You bring Tupperware for the opportunity that you like how you stumble upon free food and you're like, oh, I'll be right back. <laughs> for sure, for sure. So I think that's like one of those, like, <laughs> a lot, I've, maybe some people disagree. They're like, no, the food's like, Bleh. and I'm like, but it's free. <laughs> True. So I, True. That makes, that personally makes me happy. I, I do enjoy that perk. And right. I think that's very real. We do not get paid a lot. And I don't, no, I mean, I've never worked in outside of higher ed, so I don't know if other places will give a lot of free food, but at least for what we're working with, I, I appreciate the free food. <laughs> yeah, no, I same 100%. And you probably have every person that listens to this or every person that works in higher ed would probably be like, it's a perk. It's definitely a perk. 
It is. It is. So, so yeah, that, I'm here for that. <laughs> <laughs> Got you. Okay. So then what keeps you resilient in the face of some of the challenges you've faced? So whether that be budget cuts, stress from the pandemic, anything really that could, that could happen in your position or in your role? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I put some thought into this um, from a few angles that I'd like to share. Well, one saying that, I think I really appreciate, John, that you've created this space and this podcast to like talk about what makes you happy. Because I think a lot of times we do get bogged down by the bureaucracy and the politics and the red tape and like the things that, you know, are kind of part of working in this system, but are not by any means fun <laughs> to work with in this system. So I think you making a space for this is I just want to name like really cool because okay. I don't think you take a lot of time to reflect on what is going well or what is good um I think also too I want to name like I think when I'm thinking about resilience just in the nature of the work that we're in I think about this differently um because of my identities I identify as a cis white woman um I identify as middle class I identify as queer and at the same time I have a lot of privilege and being white in an institution of higher education, I think affords me a lot of privilege in navigating this system. Um, and so I think resilience looks different for me because I perceive I don't have, or I'm not given as many barriers to operating in this system as perhaps my other colleagues who are hold marginalized identities. So mm -hmm. naming that when I think of resilience, it's not just like, how do I like take care of myself? It's like, how do I you know, challenge this system that we're working with? And like, how do I recognize that the way I'm moving through it could be a lot easier than other people? Because um, even when we do resilience trainings um, in our departments, not, you know, there's a lot to it when we think there's like systems at play for why people can't be resilient, right? Um, and so that's that's just context that I wanted to share as like, I'm thinking about this question. Um, but things that do help me or things that have helped me be resilient, uh, so far <laughs> are, um, I've done a lot of self-advocacy, um, right. I've, I've been told, unfortunately, that no one else is going to advocate for you except for you. And so I think I've definitely learned that lesson in some sad ways, but I have definitely felt empowered to like look out for myself, protect my time, take care of me when I need to, normalizing mental health days, things like that. Um, and uh, yeah, just trying to set up an environment where I can be resilient and not always stressed out or always, you know, under the, under a lot of pressure. Um, like I said, challenging the systems that we're, that we're working within the constant need to be productive, um, thanks to white supremacy culture. So it's, yeah, a lot to unpack there, but I think advocating for myself has been really helpful. Um, I also, what helps me stay resilient and like even just like work on me in the system is that um, I really try to take feedback opportunities seriously. I ask for a lot of feedback from my supervisor, from the people I supervise. Um, and I think that's important to me because one of my core values is honesty. And so I want people to tell me like it is. Um, okay. it's, yeah, another one of those two, one of my values is authenticity. And so I want people to show up how they are. I want people to tell me what's up. <laughs> and if I'm not open to that feedback, I don't think that sets it up in a way where people, other people can advocate for what they need, um, mm -hmm. or even for me, what I need, um, to be successful. And I think the last thing I'll name, um, is therapy is a great resource. Um, I, <laughs> Haven't, I've engaged with therapy a few times, but I think there's still a lot of stigma to it. And I'm still wrestling with some of that myself, but um, using therapy over the last couple of months has been really helpful. And just like, again, me being able to name those values was not something I could do a few months ago. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think being able to have time specifically for me to check in on me and get that support um, has also helped me stay pretty resilient. So few things things in that um but those have been the most uh, salient for me got you um wow uh that was that was a lot um that was that sure. was awesome that was awesome no and I think that you touched on a lot of things and like as you I was like thinking of something that I would like 
I would add on or like say something to what you were mm -hmm. saying. And then you threw out, a, you named something else. And I was like, okay, I got to remember what I was going to say to that one. And then you named something else. And I was like, all right. After the fourth thing that you named, I was just kind of like, I lost every single thing that I was thinking of. But I will say <laughs> the one thing That's that I'm- as a host. That's hard <laughs> as a host to like constantly listen and be like, ah, oh, yeah, no I worries. Have, I have not- transition to having a notepad here but I mean that could be a potential thing that we that I look forward that I might look into moving forward um but there was one thing that you had mentioned that that really stuck with me that now I'm coming back as I'm as I'm talking through this and I think that it's like when you have the ability to name what you the first couple things that you had named about like kind of like how your identities show up in spaces and like how they show up and like the resiliency of like getting towards the systems I think another unique thing to think about and look through is how when we say that we're like we have to be resilient in some of the time like in some of the things that we face like also about how tired other individuals are so like how tired marginalized individuals are and like how we just kind of think that it's kind of like the norm to just be like we'll do this one training we'll have this one conversation and we'll be okay. But it's also that we have to continue to do these things and see how they like play out in, a, in an office environment, how they play out in the day-to-day -day life of that we're not getting hit with stuff that other individuals are getting hit with. You know, like when we talk about how like, oh, like racism doesn't happen in an office. And it's like, it, it, it's, it's, it might be subtle. It might be very subtle and it might be picked up by a few people, but it still happens, you know, and how, so people walk out of that meeting or that environment where it's just like nothing happened, but then like a few individuals are just like, well, now my day is completely shot or now I, this is something that I have to think about and how that is exhausting and now you have to keep. So I appreciate, I appreciate you naming that piece of it um, and then diving into the, the, the personal identity. So I appreciate that. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Again, I think it, you know, it, it is hard, like this is hard work. And so I think a lot of people show up to higher education, you know, genuinely wanting to do their job. And then because of the identities experiences that they hold, like they're asked to do so many other things outside of their job or, you know, to navigate the same systems of oppression that are like bigger in society and just in a microcosm on a college campus. And so, you know, I try and be mindful of that. And also too, with working in a public health specific work, a lot of people look like me. A lot of people look like white women doing this work. Um, so I think that has put it in perspective for me, you know, when we go and talk to people about mental health and people are like, I mean, sure, you might have your struggles, but like, do you understand what it's like for the emotional labor of educating people about your pronouns everywhere you go? Or like um, working as like a person of color in, a, in this system too, right? And like having to constantly educate your peers and colleagues about like, how they are experiencing this system and like that's just a lot to unpack <laughs> that we probably don't have time for on this podcast but um no. I think yeah I think just in working in this uh in higher education I think that's just definitely stuck out to me as far as like what does it mean to be resilient and like recognizing it does look different for people based on other systems and contexts that are happening and I even think too, like taking it a step further and thinking about how when we educate students about resiliency, how it's not necessarily just about the way that I see resiliency sometimes as we frame it is kind of like putting everything, putting everything back in the backpack and then just putting it back on and then continuing out with your, with your existence. But it's, it goes a little bit deeper about that because then you think in, you bring in the different identities and how that plays into it and all that other stuff. So it's not necessarily that like we need a, like a broader way of looking at resiliency is that it's not necessarily just a one-off type thing, or it's not that I have these tools and that they're going to carry me throughout the rest of my time in college. Like it's a continual thing. It's like the same thing with like self-care. It's the same thing mm -hmm. with a lot of things, you know, behavior wise is that it's sometimes you just need to be. Mm -hmm. And that kind yeah. of like levels out how we think about just showing up to spaces. You know, sometimes we get upset when like people or individuals or students, coworkers, whoever it is, don't do the things that we would like them to. We also don't think about what they're going through or like the things that are mm -hmm. happening on in their life, you know? Totally. Yeah. I Yeah. All truth. All truth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And again, yeah, just like when we're 
again, that's just like a small irk. I thought I'd have a moment here for that too. Just again, when we're asking people to be resilient, we're asking them to like, when they get down, like get back up. But what if there are things that are forcing them to stay down and why aren't we addressing those? You know? So like, I just, yeah, wanted to challenge that a smidge. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, even like thinking about something along like the lines of depression, like, mm-hmm. so the student isn't coming to class. And now all of a sudden we've given them the resources. They've gone to the, the counseling center on campus. And sometimes it still takes literally everything to go to class. And, mm-hmm. you know, then to perform at a higher level, like, I think that we just, it has to be a reevaluation of how we perceive the things that are going on. Because, you know, when we think about how the, there's a mental health push that has happened ever since right before the beginning of the pandemic, and then it was just exacerbated after that. But like, we can't necessarily think of these things that we're doing as a one-off type situation, Mm-mm. you no. know? No. So <laughs> it's like going to counseling. You can't go to counseling one time and all of a sudden I'm, I'm fixed. All the things, that, all the bad and negative experiences that I've had that have like shaped who I am as a person for better or for worse, they mm-hmm. can't, it's not just one thing that's going to get fixed. So nope. Yo, know, cou- counseling is work. <laughs> it is a lot of self-work for sure. But yeah, exactly. It, you do have to do a lot to stay resilient. So I think, yeah, one-off things are like a lot of self-soothing behaviors, which kind of lends to your, your next question too, but like self-soothing stuff around like, you know, just, just take a bath, you know, just take a bath. It's like, that's not going to solve. <laughs> that's not going to solve what, what is keeping me from being resilient, you know? So anyway, that's my soapbox. <laughs> Got you. No, I appreciate it. You know, I, like you had mentioned beforehand, creating this platform, you have a soapbox. So whatever you would like to say, <laughs> um, I am all ears. So, um, Oh, good. So then, like you had mentioned, just transitioning into the next thing. So what are some of the ways that you practice self-care to stay on your A game? Mm-hmm. Yes. Yes. So with everything I said, I think, yes, yeah, self-care is still important, taking those moments for you. I mentioned that mental health days are something that I practice, um, and it's an understanding in our office to do that. I wish more places made that a thing. Um, and it's not one of those things where you like, yeah, I don't know, you take it once you're burnt out. It's like taking it to prevent you from burning out. So I definitely try and think proactively. And I mean, definitely register with my calendar being like, where's a day that I don't have a lot that I can just block now and then bank on that being my day off for me. Um, and that's been really helpful to be able to take those breaks, um, intentionally. I also have been intentional about, uh, holding Wednesday afternoons for myself to do administrative things only. Nobody can put a meeting on my calendar on Wednesday afternoons. Um, and to me that's self-care because I, I'm a really organized person. I'm pretty like task driven. And so when I can't get things done, it it does stress me out. Um, But being able to know I have a good chunk of administrative time for me that I decide what I need to do then, um, that's really helpful. Um, And generally also with self-care, I think, well, I guess I've been talking about this, but I set boundaries. That's kind of the theme. I set set some boundaries and learning how to do that has definitely taken time. But some other ways I do that is that I don't check my email when I go home. I log out when it's time to go. Nice. Um, love to hear that. If, we love to hear yeah, that. Thank you. And I, if I work late, I flex my time. Like if I'm working late, I don't come in until later the next day. And that's understood. Um, so setting those boundaries has been very helpful in keeping me on my A game, as you put it in the question. Um, I think otherwise, I like to... Um, Another value of mine is around connection. And so I like, I really like to spend time with my fiance, Brent. (laughs) We're not used to saying that. That's why I put a little accent on it. We're not used to saying that right now. (laughs) Um, But also my, my sister, Audrey lives in Denver. My best friend moved to Denver. And so spending time with them is like, and having that connection with other people that are important to me is also really, really important for my mental health. Um, Mm -hmm. So yeah. So setting boundaries is its own camp. And then spending time with people I like want to spend time with is its other thing. <laughs> yeah. And you, and you had mentioned a ton of things in there, but the one thing that I did appreciate, and there's two things that I really, really appreciated one of like the not checking things outside of work. Cause I think that that's like, it just 
so common, you know, that we always like, I think that sometimes when we talk about like how our cell phones have made us so um, made things better. I also think for a lack of a better word, they made it way worse because yeah. we're always connected, you know, like when you think about like the warm hearted, like I have the ability to, to, to FaceTime my mom or dad, I have the ability to um, catch up with people that I don't know, that I don't live in the same state anymore, you know, um, but then also how, you know, work could email me and I'm always like, oh, well, should I check it? Should I not check it? Well, I'm already in the, I'm already on my phone. It's unlocked. Let me check it real quick. Mm -hmm. You know, and like how like little things like that can just, they take a lot out of you, you know, like you're like, oh, I'll deal with this tomorrow. But how does that, what's that look like for your rest of your night? You know, like, are you going to dwell on that? Or the idea of, oh, I'll just, I'll, I'll go on the computer real quickly. I'll take care of this and then I'll be okay. But then Mm -hmm. by the time you're done, that's like 45 minutes of your evening. And you're just like, you know, like, how did I get here? <laughs> yeah. But I mean, I think you also set it up to like, you know, it's kind of like the white supremacy, the capitalism, the, you know, the idea, I think something that I've struggled with recently is the idea behind like motivational videos and like how people like talk about the grind and like how, you know, like I have a lot of, I have, I have a lot of dreams and a lot, a lot of aspirations on like what I want to do to where I want to end up. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, there's no way that I'm going to get there if I'm continuing to do my 40 hour work week job and then do more work on top of that to, to just basically set, set a foundation for something more. And I think that that's, we, we watch these videos and all of a sudden we're like, yeah, I'm not doing enough. I got to do more. Um, and then it leads me into the idea of like your, your mental health days, which I think are awesome. And the idea of taking it before you're burnt out. Cause I know so many people that I can name right now that have, that in the past, four months, however many months it's been since things have gotten, things have not slowed down for us um, at at A&M that have been like, I just cannot take a day. Like I have nowhere to take a day, Mm -hmm. you know? And then you don't do, you don't take a day for yourself or a vacation or anything along those lines. Because sometimes when we think about vacation, we don't have to drive or go visit somewhere. We could literally, a staycation is a dream sometimes. (laughs) Um, but they can't, they can't do that. They can't do that because they're so all the meetings, they have all the things and all just life that happens, you know, inside the workplace is just chaotic sometimes, Mm -hmm. you know, but having the ability to be like, I did take, I I worked that after hours program or that I gave that presentation or that workshop and tomorrow, or I'm taking off early on Friday and having Mm -hmm. the ability to do that is a blessing at some places, like you said. Yeah, totally. No, thank you for sharing that too, as far as like that resonating with you. And you're, it's true. It's like, we just like constantly get so much pressure to do more because that's how capitalism and white supremacy survive. And it's like, if we really care about equity work, it's like, we need to not do that. And so I think, you know, redefining that for ourselves of like, what does it mean to be productive? When, when is enough enough? Um, and, you know, taking that time for you and let alone also having some life outside of work. Like we spend so much time working in mm-hmm. our jobs, um, but reconnecting outside of work with other things that are like important to us is, yeah, so important. <laughs> um, and not constantly feeling like you just have to keep doing more. Like I felt self-conscious, I will admit, in working in higher ed. Like I have a lot of colleagues who they do this job they're also getting their doctorate they're also like uh have a side hustle you know like you know doing their thing and I've sometimes felt self-conscious of like oh I'm not like participating in this this grind like you said and like feeling a way about that but I think definitely uh throughout the height of the pandemic is what I'll say we're still thinking about COVID aren't we um some I of think, us, some of us are, I mean, okay, I don't want to, I don't want to name names, <laughs> but they're few and far in between on who still thinks COVID's out there. Well, no, that's fair. Well, I know for me, I'm still thinking about it. Okay. Um, but I think definitely working remotely during the height of the pandemic really affirmed to me that I'm like, this work is not my life. It can't be my life. This is not a sustainable model for how I want to live and accomplish things that I want to. Um, even if I don't have like very concrete hobbies outside. I just like the ability to like, know I have time to do what I want and like what I feel like. Um, so yes, all of those things. It's, I definitely, I think mental health days are so important. And if you are a manager listening to this, I think 
advocating for this in your department will just do great for morale and you know achieving your mission so all to say i recommend <laughs> nice nice no I, I appreciate you saying that um and something that i think about too is like on a future you had mentioned phd but like as a future uh potential case study is that i want to just throw out there is the idea between overworking so like being on that grind doing all these things and disassociating and like what the how that plays into each other of like if I don't take the time to breathe or to like just be with my own thoughts feelings and you know think about how things play out in your life they, they don't mean anything to me because I'm doing all these things I have so much on my plate so mm -hmm. I think a lot of people are in that boat like really quick to distract themselves with more things rather than address the real feelings or things that are like coming up for them by virtue of the things that they're doing right they're like oh i'll just move on to something else and then i'll i'll put off thinking about whatever that is that i really should think about to take care of me <laughs> you know yeah well i think it it even goes back to the idea of you, you mentioned feelings like did you ever in k-12 through higher education did you ever like have that ability for someone to explain what different feelings are and like mm -hmm. how, not necessarily how you should feel them because that's very subjective to the person, but right. what they just mean and how they could manifest and kind of like do a deep dive into that. Because I think when we, sometimes when we use, when we use language and like, and sometimes this happens in higher ed a lot is that we just assume that people know what we're talking about when we say things like the buzzwords, the, the common buzzwords, be resilient, do some self-care, um, feel your feelings. Like, if no one has, if anyone has never had the, had the opportunity or the ability to know how to do that, it's really challenging to tell someone, hey, if you're angry, like you need to feel and think about like what is making you angry and like go through those emotions. And if you've never had those skills or no one has ever taught you how to do that, like mm -hmm. you're basically, you're, you're 20 feet behind everyone else or you're not even in the same field as everyone else when we say these things and it's once again it makes the work more challenging and but it's just something to think about you know and like about the whole equity thing that you have brought up too so mm -hmm. yeah exactly if we really care we need to meet people where they're at and support them where they are um and yeah give people permission to feel those feelings i think i think that's a really good point you bring up without like a lot of like space to process and coach and again just with our constant culture of just like just keep doing just keep pushing just like keep keep not paying attention to how your body's feeling or how you feel um yeah it does get hard to name those and then when you know people i guess can identify they're like oh this is just uncomfortable or yucky or shameful or judgmental and like i just don't want to go there um so normalizing more that like we can show up that way especially at work um and that we can open up to people about like how that's impacting us and especially impacting our work because again that directly affects how we do our job how we support our students like if you know it, and that feels like a cliche if you're not taking care of you how can you take care of other people but in that regard that feels true if you're not paying attention to what you need based on the things that are coming up for you like in the long run yeah you'll probably burn out Yep. And I was explaining to this, to, I think it was to my mom, actually, when we were talking over the phone. And that was one of the things that we talked about, how I didn't realize that burnout, if you like completely burn out from something or just burn out in general, it takes you like four to five years to like regain a sense of not, not feeling like everything is like bogging you down. Um, yeah, I, do. I do not have, I do not have where I read that, uh, it was scholarly, which is terrible to say that I read scholarly stuff for fun. Um, okay. but it was done in a re and I will, if the next time I have a podcast, I may say it out loud. I don't know, but, um, but yeah, I was reading something about that. And I was just thought that was interesting because, you know, like saying, seeing on this podcast as someone that's 25, 29 to finally feel something or to not like to have the passion back for something is just mind-boggling you know yeah we don't have time for that yeah <laughs> oh. so mm -mm, so true yeah. yeah so the last question since 
I appreciate, I appreciate the conversations that we've been having. But the last question that I have for you is what is one piece of advice you live by in your practice? Yeah, I feel like this will be a good summary of the things that I have already brought up. Um, and again, have definitely reflected on this a lot in the last year and a half. Um, but a colleague told me that there's a book title with this in it. And I think about it a lot now. It's, uh, the title of that book is Work Won't Love You Back. And that has stuck with me again for a lot of the reasons and things that we've already talked about on this podcast. Like, you know, knowing that there's, we're always going to be making more work for ourselves. There's always more work. Um, but it's again, super important to like advocate for what you need to, in order to do that work. Um, because this system is not very giving. It is going to take as much as it can out of you. Um, and I think, preserving your own you know what you need <laughs> in your life is so important um finding things that make you happy outside of this system outside of your job i think is another piece of advice and although i'm giving that advice i'll definitely name i'm still working on that <laughs> i think you know it's taken a lot to like unpack some of the pieces of me that's like very overachieving and just wants to keep producing um and so that's something that I am more so living by, but it's still a work in progress is finding those things that make me happy outside of this job. Because again, there are pieces of higher ed that I really do appreciate and higher ed has, you know, a lot of potential that I'm excited about. And also it, it shouldn't, it shouldn't be my life. My dad has always said, even in his job, which he's not enthusiastic about, but he's done for a long time. Um, he said to me once, he's like, I, I work to live. I don't live to work. And I was like, yes, that, <laughs> that is what I'm going to live by, um, throughout my career. So that is, yeah. Shout out to my dad <laughs> for that wisdom. <laughs> Got you. No. And I think that's, I think that those are very wise words. Cause I think that sometimes we, we can't, we can't create that line or that boundary of what, is and isn't us a part of work so like where do we like I even think about that too like I, I hung out with some friends this past weekend from work and I that was the first thing that like that I said I was like for for the rest of the night we are not talking about anything COVID related um because once again some of us talk about it all the time because it's 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 real it's scary uh and two that like I don't want to talk about anything about work like there is no need no need to bring it up and like even and like these people are amazing people, but like they kind of joked about it for a little bit. But at the same time, like this is why I bring this up because we joke around about it. And then all of a sudden, oh, I just need to say this one thing about work. And then all of a sudden, you know, 45 minutes go by, speaking of time. And then we're just like, yeah, that was. And, you know, it, and I'm not saying that like other people don't have to get that off their chest, because I think that like if people have the ability to, to hold space for that, that's that's amazing. But I think sometimes not everyone in a social setting has the space or capacity for that. Like, you know, mm -hmm. sometimes people just want to be there for the connection or for the activity that's happening. You know, maybe you're maybe you're at a bar, maybe you're at like all I can think of is axe throwing right now for some reason because that was something that our that our office. That's something had. you want to do. After well, that's <laughs> yeah, right now. I'm actually going to leave right, right now, now and go do that. Um, <laughs> but that was something that was brought up as like doing that. But I think that like it needs to differentiate the fact that like this is John going to this. This is not John that works in his position at the school that does this type of work because like my whole like spiel of who I am should not be the same on and off work you know if that makes if that makes sense so yeah oh it definitely does I think we're on the same wavelength with a lot of this too so yeah totally I think it's fair to set those boundaries when you're with people outside of your workspace is like do we want to talk about work or maybe somebody like wants to vent and just get it out and being like okay that's it we're done <laughs> um but I think too and I feel like this comes up a lot and Again, much appreciation for you doing this podcast. I think it would be, wouldn't it be great if we like talked about our jobs more in like a positive light, like talking about what makes us happier or it's something exciting that happens and not kind of this natural desire to just like harp on or 
tell people about the things that aren't going great or, you know, like how cool would that be if we talked about work in more of a positive light? And I feel like a lot of these things as far as taking care of us could really help that. No, I think, I think you're, I think you're right. Very right. So mm-hmm. just food for thought, you know, just. <laughs> that's, that's essentially what, the, that's essentially what this is. Some food for thought. And again, yeah. I'm just, I'm no expert. I'm sharing just things I've processed and interpreted your lovely questions. So yeah, I think that's, yeah, again, just good to think about like, yeah, are you, are you living to work? Or are you working to live? <laughs> So everyone needs to think about that now. <laughs> yeah, Question of the day. The that's the call to action. <laughs> Got you. Okay. Well, is there, I am out of questions. Is there anything else that you would like to add uh, before, before we wrap up here? <sighs> no, this feels great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, thank you for your questions. And again, for providing this space. Um, yeah, this was great. I yeah. appreciated getting to uh, kind of cathartic in a way, I guess, just being like, Huh, here's what I think. <laughs> it's honestly, I, I've told many people that have asked me about like what it's like like doing the podcast. And I think that like sometimes it depending upon, you know, just how life happens. So like sometimes some weeks I don't have an episode just because I can't do it or because That's okay, dude. You know, but I think but it's also like it's a really good feeling because like while this is additional work that I don't get paid for, um, it's really cool to like hear people, you know, and like, while I've been staying in my network, like I originally, I originally, I want to eventually branch out and uh, into, into doing more like people not in my network. Um, Cause like, there's a sense of like comfortability here, which is like totally fine. But I think that like having more individuals that have different experiences and different, different things to offer to the podcast, I think that's what will make it more, I wouldn't say more beneficial, but I think it will just add a different, a different experience to it. Um, because yeah, like you said, like it's very euphoric, you know, and having that cathartic to be like, this was great, you know? <laughs> so yeah, you're listening but, to me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I've always been told I'm a good listener. So Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. yeah, again, thank you for, yeah, thank you for this space and thank you for listening. And I appreciate yeah. um, the things you shared throughout this podcast too. I think your perspectives are also um, pretty awesome. So thank you. Gotcha. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. So, <laughs> all right. Well, uh, thank you. Thank you, Ava, again, uh, <laughs> uh, for being here and for uh, for answering my questions. Uh, I just want to say at the end of every episode, like I normally do, um, don't forget to uh, subscribe and like the YouTube channel as well as listen to us uh, on Spotify and Apple Podcast. So with that being said, I hope everyone has a great rest of their day and uh, I'll see you next time. Bye.